Good evening, Golden Bears. I'm Dan Mogulov from UC Berkeley's Office of Communications and Public Affairs. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this live online question and answer session with Chancellor Nick Dirks. Chancellor Dirks, welcome. Thank you. Now, in advance of this event, we received several hundred questions and suggested topics of discussion from alumni and parents around the world. Based on a tally of your interests, we will tonight be talking to the Chancellor about the issues that rose to the top of your collective agenda. However, many of these questions were received before Berkeley Law School Dean Sujit Chowdhury resigned from his position in the wake of an investigation that found he had violated sexual harassment policies, as well as today's news that the university has relieved an assistant basketball coach of his duties after an investigation found that he too had violated those same policies. Chancellor Dirks, I know you'd like to address this situation and talk a little bit about the university's response. Thank you, Dan. In fact, before we have our conversation, I really do welcome this opportunity to speak to you directly about the fact that we have had some high profile sexual harassment cases here at UC Berkeley, and they have raised deep and understandable concerns. Now, I've been deeply alarmed by the frequency of these cases and I am committed to ensuring a safe community for all of our students, staff, and faculty in their wake. I want to acknowledge that some recent decisions in cases of sexual misconduct have in fact exacerbated these concerns. I certainly regret any errors in judgment. Now I care deeply about Berkeley, and I want this to be a welcoming, inclusive, and safe community for every member of it. In the coming days, we will take decisive steps to implement more appropriate and more effective ways to rid our campus of sexual assault and harassment. Unfortunately, this is happening all too often across the country, and it happens in universities across the land as well as across the UC. I am eager to support last week's actions by President Janet Napolitano to pursue this reform on all 10 UC campuses. Her leadership here is a welcome step and it will help ensure that remedies and penalties are applied firmly and consistently across the university. Now we need new thinking and we need new procedures. We have to make a break with the past and rethink how we address these issues and prevent future ones. I'll be working with campus leaders and colleagues. We'll invite experts in this area from around the country and they'll help us develop immediate and actionable improvements and turn our story from one of disappointment to one of leadership as befits Berkeley. I take very seriously my responsibility to protect the integrity of our learning and working environment, and I make a personal commitment to see that critical and urgent reforms are put in place that will change our culture as well as our behavior, and thus genuinely ensure the safety of our environment. We'll be saying more about these steps in the days ahead. Thank you, Chancellor Dirks. And I think we know we've received a lot of, we've received mail from alumni and we've seen some of the online comments. And I think people are somewhat skeptical. They have know the university has struggled with this in the past and they've heard these words, but it sounds like there is a new sort of a commitment and understanding that the time for talk is over and it's time for action. How confident are you that we're gonna be able to do what needs to be done in this regard? Well, we are working on every available channel to make sure that we will make a decisive break with the past. And Dan, it includes things like a new orientation, uh, new mandatory training in sexual harassment. We're going to pro provide opportunities for faculty, staff, and students uh, to get much more direct uh, uh, information about what sexual harassment is and how to make sure we can rid our campus of this uh, uh, for, for, for for good. We have to. Uh, and I, I think there's a general commitment across uh, the, the university to make sure we do take these steps and people will be watching and we will make them. Thank you. And I know we're going to be hearing more from you and from other campus leaders in the future about this. And I think we all look forward to that. So now let's turn to the alumni and parent questions. And they include questions about Berkeley's public character and mission academic restructuring, undergraduate education, and alumni and parent engagement. So let's jump right in. Now, Nick, the subject that generated by far the most interest was how Berkeley will preserve its excellence and its public character in an era of financial difficulty. There's no doubt that many parents and alumni have heard about the campus's recently announced budget challenges, and they wanna know how will Berkeley remain the number one public university in the country 
given those hurdles? Well, we do have some hurdles. Uh, when we released uh, the statement a month ago about the nature of our financial challenges and also some of the steps that we're taking to engage them and try to work through them, uh, we did something that is fairly untypical. Uh, we actually put out an announcement and it was carried by newspapers from the New York Times and the Washington Post to San Francisco Chronicle and uh, the Los Angeles Times. We said we have a major def deficit, $150 million. It's a structural deficit. That means it's not going to go away. It's not the result of just one-time expenditures. It's built into our operations, our salaries, our debt repayment, uh, and indeed other fixed costs. So this is not something that we can just hold our breath and assume will go away. Uh, by the same token, we have significant reserves and we have time uh, to engage in deliberate uh, and, uh, and, and, and hugely participatory conversations across, across the campus to make sure we do things that are, that are right, that uh, befit Berkeley's excellence, its commitment, and of course its public mission. So let me channel a question that was posed by Paul from the class of 2006 and he asked, why is there an increasing annual budget deficit at Berkeley? What is driving the financial challenges that you're now confronting? Well, you know, I've been spending a lot of my time uh, uh, delving into the budgetary uh, details of our situation, but there are a few things that I think I can say that will help put this into context. First, uh, it's important to say we are in the fifth year of a six-year tuition freeze. Now, even universities like Stanford with endowments that are you know, $22, $23 billion raise their tuition every year. We don't. Uh, and in fact, after the, raise, the, 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 the raises in tuition that took place after uh, the huge state disinvestment that took place in the wake of the financial, financial crisis of 2008, 2009, we decided we wanted to hold things steady. But it has consequences. So it is now the major source, that is to say tuition is the major source of our revenues. We get uh, more tuition than any other single revenue source. After that, we get money to support our research through contracts and grants. After that, we raise money through philanthropy. And after that is state support. It was completely opposite 20 years ago. I think most uh, of you know uh, who are listening to this that only 13% of our overall budget comes from the state. But you know, because we therefore expect uh, tuition to play such a major role, the fact that we've held it constant has contributed to this. Now, that's not the only thing. We've had costs that have gone up in the domain of the contributions we make for pensions. We didn't used to have to contribute anything towards that. I that heard used that's to be, gone up by $100 million a year or more. That's correct. It's now 14% uh, of, every, uh, of every salary we pay. Uh, but we also have uh, major and rising capital costs uh, around, uh, well, we have debt repayment for capital costs. Now that's uh, for a number of different reasons. The most important reason is that we are the oldest campus and the most seismically challenged campus of any of the UCs. Oh, so you mean infrastructure spending? This is for buildings, uh, both uh, to build new ones, uh, to renovate uh, uh, older ones, ones that were seismically challenged, the stadium. Uh, is a good example of a, of, a, of a disaster waiting to happen. We had to do something about it. So 65% of what we've spent on capital costs, on buildings in particular, is because of our seismic uh, challenges. And we have one last project that we're engaged in that we have to do, which is the building of the Berkeley Way building. It's to replace Tolman Hall, which for those of you out there who spend time in Tolman Hall, I want you to know you wouldn't want to be spending time there today. It is the riskiest building on campus. So it's going to come down. But the, uh, the debt service on all of these projects uh, has risen to the point where it will be in the next couple of years close to our entire deficit. Now, Peter from the class of 2005, I believe, captured a question I, that's on the minds of a lot of alumni. We've received a lot of messages about this, and that has to do with the college, the future of the College of Chemistry and public health. What exactly is going on there, and what are your plans and aspirations as far as those two schools are concerned? Well, let me begin by framing the strategic planning process that we announced at the same time that we announced our financial challenges. There are four major areas of focus. First is academic realignment. Second, administrative alignment. Third is uh, ramping up uh, our revenue generation from fundraising and other sources. And the fourth is to look at our athletic program. 
So those are pretty comprehensive. They cover the spectrum of the campus. And to some extent, what we're saying, we have a table here, is that everything's on it. So when we do that, and when we do it around academic realignment, uh, you know, naturally, uh, people start thinking about how we might redesign the structures, the basic structures of the university. Now, in many cases, the structures we have, the departments, the units, the programs, the schools, colleges, date back to the late 19th century. And now, of course, we are entering uh, the second part of the second decade of the 21st century. And what we need to do is to really think what is going to work best for the 21st century. Now, in looking at some of the schools and colleges we have, we know that we have excellent programs. We're not going to touch them, except insofar as we might be able to better support them. The College of Chemistry is a good example. We have number one Department of Chemistry in this country. The college has two departments, the Department of, uh, of, of, of Chemistry and the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. And you know they are both top departments. Would they do better if they were more closely affiliated with physics and mathematics? That was the question that was posed to deans. But I can assure you at this point, we have neither any plan to dissolve one of our strongest programs, nor would we do anything that would compromise the capacity of our chemistry program to be the top one in, in the nation. And public health? Public health uh, was actually something that had to do with the concerns on the part of the School of Public Health that they uh, uh, are incurring additional costs in educating our undergraduates. Uh, when we found that they made this announcement, we talked with them and made sure that, uh, uh, that the undergraduate program uh, would be reinstated uh, and it will continue for certainly uh, the, the current class uh, that's there. But again, Dan, the, the point here is not that we've made any decisions. We haven't. The point is that we're really trying to figure out, are there better ways to structure a university that has so many different programs, colleges, schools, units, and the like? Are there ways in which some of the smaller professional schools, for example, might work better together? They might work better together in financial planning. They might work better together in fundraising. Uh, they might work better together in academic terms. So for example, one of the kinds of conversations that's very much been generated by faculty is how to bring together people interested in the biological sciences or how to bring together people from different colleges who are interested in big data and data analytics and information and the like. So it's a time that is incredibly rich in terms of conversation, but also in terms of rumor. And I'm afraid some of these things are solely that rumor. But I can also understand people's anxiety because yeah. the, using the term you just used, everything is on the table. Sure. And we did get a lot of questions about, will Berkeley continue to maintain access and will it continue to maintain its public mission? And I think I've heard some things from you suggest that those two items may not be on the table, but I want to let you talk about that in your own words. Well, there are three things that are not on the table. Our academic excellence, our commitment to access, and our public mission. Now, I just have to say that when we say our public mission is not on the table, that doesn't mean that we're getting the kind of support from the state that we used to get. But you know, in, 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 fundamentals, in a fundamental sense, Berkeley is about its public mission. And the research we do, the education we offer reflects that. You see it in, for example, the fact that our undergraduate student body here is one third from uh, Pell Grant eligible families. That so means families, making, families making less than $45,000, right. $50,000. And recently in the New York Times, there was a poll of, uh, of ranking of universities on the basis of access. And in the top 10 were six University of California campuses, and Berkeley was one of them. Now I might add, and this goes to the other part of the uh, things that are, not, the, the, one of the other things that's not on the table, is the fact that we were the only one, the only university on that top 10 list in terms of access that is also routinely ranked in the top five or 10 in terms of academic excellence. That will continue to be the case. Now, I just want to know, we're going to move on to the next section. I, I know that people have a lot of other questions and a lot of other concerns about the university. And I just sort of wanted to note that this is going to be a five-year process. We're operating from a position of strength to bring our budget into balance. Absolutely. And there's going to be a lot more communications. And we're really just at the beginning, right, where we're tossing ideas around and thinking about how we're going to proceed in a very collaborative way. 
Absolutely. We are at the beginning stages, and we wanted to announce the fact that we were going to do this so that people understood that we were inviting their participation. Uh, we're developing timelines so that we can do, uh, uh, do this in a, in a way that is open and transparent. Uh, and we know that at some point there are going to be some hard decisions to make. So we're going to switch gears now because we received more than 50 questions regarding undergraduate education. And predominantly they were questions about how a major research university like Berkeley supports its undergraduate population and what kinds of new programs Berkeley is enacting to ensure students succeed once they graduate. To kick this section off, Cal Parent Santosh writes, transitioning from a small high school to UC Berkeley was a very big change for my son. To what extent is the undergraduate population a priority, a real priority at the university? And what, Chancellor, is your administration doing to ensure these students don't feel lost? Well, you know, that's a great question. It is. Because it speaks to the heart of what our undergraduate initiative is all about. When I came here, the first thing I began to hear and to some extent see was that concern on the part of so many students and their families. The concern about being lost. About potentially being lost, about arriving to this large campus and maybe falling through the cracks. Now, there have been enormous strides that have been taken by the faculty and staff here to try to prevent that from happening. And the investments in undergraduate education and student advising and mentoring and all kinds of other programs that are precisely uh, designed to, uh, to, to engage that question uh, have been made. But I think we can do more. And in a way, this goes back even to Clark Kerr, you know, the great first chancellor of the university who was then the president of the University of California system uh, in the late 50s and early 60s, the architect of the master plan. But the one thing he said that Berkeley lacked was the kind of commitment to the undergraduate experience that would parallel its commitment to graduate training and to faculty research. So this is not something new. And what we've done is to commit to finding ways to improve the undergraduate experience and precisely try to create the conditions under which students can come here, take advantage of the extraordinary array of opportunities that are here, but not feel lost, and in fact, uh, have a sense of community and a sense of engagement that makes them really feel that they have the advantages of a smaller college while also being able to take advantage of the huge number of things that are here that small liberal arts colleges or even medium-sized liberal arts colleges simply don't have. But I can understand that some people might be concerned that now, given the financial challenges, that these might be aspirations and plans and a vision of yours that is imperiled by what we're facing. Is that the case, or do you think we can continue to advance on the goals you've set out for us? Well, in fact, I think our financial challenges make it all the more imperative that we engage in a thorough review of our undergraduate program. 27,000 of our 37,000 students are undergraduates. We want to make sure those students really do succeed. Of course, when they succeed and they become alumni, we will come back to them and we'll ask them for help. And we want them to say, well, you know, I owe so much to this great university. And I felt the kind of you know, commitment they had to my success. Uh, I want to be able to be part of its success over the course of my lifetime. Sorry for that little pitch. <laughs> <That's all right. laughs> so I want to uh, now uh, turn to a question that Olivia posed, Olivia from the class of 1969. I hope she's with us tonight. And she asked, what are some of the new programs being offered at Berkeley to keep students current? Yeah. Well, you know, part of the undergraduate initiative has been uh, focused on residential life. And it's been uh, addressing the fact that housing is a critical concern. Uh, it's been uh, dealing with the increases in enrollment that we've been uh, undertaking. So, uh, so, so one thing we're, we're really looking at is a way to better connect the residential experience with the academic experience. Now, partly this is about inserting new kinds of programs in the residence halls. Partly, and I just want to make this uh, clear even though we're talking about how to stay current, uh, it partly means building more housing, mm -hmm. which Dan, we're going to have to do in different ways. We don't have the budget where we can just go and, and build a dorm. But we can partner with third party uh, uh, developers and we can actually engage them in ways that will allow them to see a business model that will allow them to build the dorm, but keep it at rates that are consistent across our housing system, uh, but also build them to spec. Build them to a spec, in fact, 
that is designed to insert in the dorm some academic kinds of opportunities, programs, connectors, and the like. Now, one of the things that allows us to do is to connect the lives of students more with the way in which we organize our curriculum. Mm -hmm. Another part of the undergraduate initiative, which builds on this, is what we are calling the data science initiative. And this has involved faculty getting together from different programs, from computer science, from statistics, from physics, and for that matter, the history of science, among computational biology, among other uh, units on, on campus, to design a new pilot course in which students who take this course, it's a kind of core course, but fashioned in ways that will plug in mm -hmm. to connect with majors and interests across from you know history, philosophy, mm -hmm. and English to biology, physics, So and not astronomy. just for a science major, but for... This is for all of our students. I mean, right now it's a pilot, so uh, we're just beginning with several hundred students in, 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 in this semester. But this course will provide for students a sense of what it means to graduate into a world in which data and data analytics is going to be critical to everything they do. It doesn't matter what they do, some kind of computation and some kind of data is going to be critical to it. So in a way, what we're doing by this is to introduce into our common core uh, set of requirements something that is going to carry on the best of the liberal arts and sciences tradition, but be as current and in fact as forward future looking as possible for all of our students. Now, I know there's another area, and there was a question about that, that's near and dear to your heart that we're also advancing on. And because since you arrived at campus, you've been a major advocate for the arts at Berkeley. Um, and G from the class of 1965, she asks, or he asks, I'm sorry, um, what is the appropriate role for arts and humanities in an undergraduate's education at UC Berkeley? And I think that's a really interesting question because, you know, when you listen to the current national debate and discussion, it seems more and more that people see the university as really just advanced vocational training. But I know you have some very specific views in this area. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that and connect that to the arts and what we're doing in terms of the arts and undergraduates. Well, you know, there are two parts here, and I think one of them has to do with the role that humanities plays in, uh, in creating the experience of a student and allowing them to think through in relationship to some of the great debates of our, of our history, not just in uh, Western civilization, but in a lot of other cultures and contexts, and to use those debates to think about the big issues. What does it mean to be a citizen, whether of the US, the world, what have you? What does it mean to live the good life? Do you do that as an individual, or do you do it in relationship to a sense of community obligation? These are the questions that are core to the humanities, and we want to make sure that the moral compass of our curriculum shines brightly uh, as our students work here, learn here, uh, and prepare for the future. And if, you know, in a way, that's, that's, that's an exemplification of our public mission. Right? We're trying right. to create leaders, thinkers for the future on the part of all of our students. In the arts, you know, it's very much connected, of course. The arts uh, often uh, provide experiences that allow us, both as individuals and as members of, 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 of society, to engage some of the most critical issues, sometimes issues that we can't even put as powerfully anyway, mm -hmm. uh, in normal prose. You know, whether it's seeing an extraordinary play, listening to, uh, to, to music that, uh, that, that, that just, you know, grabs the soul and commands your attention. And of course, in, uh, in, 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 in our student body, we have, we have many students who will come with a very specific set of cultural experiences and backgrounds, but in many cases, without uh, exposure to, uh, to a broad set of cultural experiences. Now, even here on the campus, but certainly in the East Bay, there are activities in the arts going on all the time. So one of the things we're developing for our students is a culture pass, a way of making it possible to subsidize to the extent possible membership, uh, uh, participation in, uh, 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 attendance uh, at concerts, uh, museums, the New Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive is opening up its doors to, uh, to students across campus. Cal Performances does that, but many other organizations are doing it. And in fact, we now have a new associate vice chancellor on campus who is specifically charged with making the arts and design part of the experience of all of our undergraduate students. So before we move on to the next section, I want to ask you, you've been here long enough now to really have a good feel for, for Cal and for Cal students. You've been at a number of higher institutions of higher education around the country. 
It's a dangerous question. <laughs> Be careful. But what, what do you make of Cal students? What makes them different? What makes them unique? What is it that gives this place its unique sort of energy? Well, these students, uh, they're all extraordinary. They are extraordinary. They are a little different. And just to be clear, I know most people know that I was at Columbia University before I came here and before that at the University of Michigan and before that at Caltech. So I've seen a lot of different students and, you know, I love them all. Uh, but there's something different and something special here. And it has to do, I think, uh, in part with why students come here. When you ask them, you know, why did you come to, to Berkeley? You know, what made you apply? What made you come? And I ask them all the time when I, when I meet them, whether I meet them in fireside chats or on campus or wherever. They all say, you know, it's a great school. This is a place where I can, you know, I can do just about anything. But often a very specific goal is, uh, you know, is stated. But then they say, and Berkeley's the place, you know, that stands for social justice. Or Berkeley's the place where, you know, you can get the best of what you could get at a public, at a private institution, but in a public. Berkeley's a place that has such diversity among its student body that I'm going to, I'm going to see the world here. And of course, it also has uh, that sense of the world because there's so much activity, so much vitality. Uh, you have a city, of course, uh, within uh, a set of cities that are part of uh, uh, the Bay Area, but a city that has also got great natural beauty and unbelievable cultural resources. But more than anything else, people, whether st fellow students, faculty, staff, who all share that common belief in the public mission. You know, I did want to ask you one other thing about the housing. I just want to say a few words about the Bulls Hall project. I oh, mean, yeah, it's sure. extraordinary that we have alumni yeah. who have sort of stepped in to refurbish that, not just that building, but they're going to be, it's more than just a refurbishment of a building, isn't it? Indeed. And in fact, it's a wonderful il illustration of what we're, uh, what we're hoping to do. Uh, in large part, learning from the experience of, of Bowles Hall. So alumni from Bowles Hall got together. They were very proud of the fact that Bowles was the first residential college built in the U.S., before Harvard, before Yale. People don't know that. But in 1927 was when Bowles Hall was built, and it was the first. Now, it wasn't first, the only one for long, but it, it, it was the first. Uh, what happened as Bowles became a normal dorm is that some of these alums got together and said, there's something special about this place. But it's, you know, it's fallen down. It's, it looks great from a distance. The closer you get, mm, the, the dicier. better she doesn't look. The right? dicier. So they said, we're going to, uh, you know, we want the university to refurbish this. But, you know, they, they, they soon learned we didn't have the money for that. So they raised it. Mm -hmm. And then they worked to develop an idea for a 21st century version of a, of a residential college with faculty living in with uh, programming built into Bowles Hall, with the idea that Bowles Hall would not just be a cool place to live, but also a place where the Berkeley experience would be uh, encapsulated and, where students and expressed. And where students wouldn't get lost, it sounds like, based on that first question. And where they won't get heard. lost. And you know, if we can pull this off, yeah. we can pull it off across the board. So it's but a little bit is, of a pilot this project? This is a pilot. This is a pilot. But we're, we're just thrilled that, uh, that it was an alumni-driven pilot, which we're now building on and hoping to expand significantly. Super. Um, so we're going to move now into the final topic for this evening. And um, that one speaks to the pride that alumni and parents have in UC Berkeley. I really feel like I should say Cal in that regard, because when you talk about the emotions of our yep. parents and alumni, they talk about Cal um, and how deeply they care about this institution's future. And that when they sort of think about that and when they pose the questions and the topics they wanted to have discussed, it was really about engagement, about how they can be involved as alumni and parents, about how they can rally to our side and help support and sustain all the things that made this place special to them. Um, so let me just talk a little bit about how you see these groups becoming involved in supporting our efforts, supporting that effort to maintain our public mission, supporting the effort to um, build a new sustainable financial foundation. Is there, is there a role for alumni? Is, uh, is there a role for parents? Yes. And I'm really grateful that, uh, that, that, that the alumni and parents uh, who've written in have, have put that uh, on the agenda for this discussion. Uh, the, the role they, play, they can play is, is critical. And the role they play is critical. I mean, first of all, I mean, I've felt this even since uh, before I formally began this role when I was visiting different alumni organizations around both the state of California and, uh, and the U.S. I felt that 
there was a sense of connection to Cal, and you're right. Uh, and in fact, what you know, what what I aim to do in some sense is to bring the Berkeley and the Cal together, so that they complement each other and they don't seem to polarize. Mm -hmm. But what you know, what 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 Cal speaks to, is that sense of connection, but also of a sense that you know this place matters. This place is important. It's important both because of what it is, and because of what it signifies more generally. And I've, I've, I've learned that first from alums and and from parents. And of course, parents are the ones who give you the straightest uh, uh, evaluation of how you're doing as an educational institution. And when they say, you know, uh, my son, my daughter, they're having a great experience. That's what that's what makes us. So what can feel. they do? What, what can they do? Should they be writing letters to the governor? Well, Should they be? But it is it is a moment where we need you more than ever. Uh, governor, yes, write letters to the governor. Write letters to your, your, your letters. legislators. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, advocate for the university in whatever circle you have access to because we need, we need not just understanding, we actually need advocacy. This is a time when public universities are under significant duress. You just heard me say earlier that you know, our, our, our state uh, allocation is down to 13% of our overall budget. I mean, it was when Chancellor Bergenau began his time here, it was at uh, roughly 30%. This is a real change. I, I actually, just to interrupt, I heard another amazing stat that it used to be we got from the state $13,000, approximately $13,000 per student. It's down to about 8,000. So when you think about it in a per capita level. It's actually down to 7,500 now. So Hush my yeah, mouth. Yeah. So, you know, this this is a very different environment uh, for sustaining the kind of uh, university that we've all come to believe is critical and that we rely on uh, in all kinds of ways. So what I think uh, is necessary, look, we, we need alums to support us. We need them to write checks. We need material support. We need to be able to do as well as the Stanfords and the Harvards and the other great private universities of the world because we need that support. We need to build an endowment. We need to have an endowment so that the future of Berkeley can be assured. But we need much more than that. I said advocacy, but I think there are other things as well. And they connect then to the larger question that you began this with, or rather that uh, some of our friends have uh, put on the table for us. And that is, what, what is the public mission? You know, is that public mission going to stay as you use more and more private uh, resources to support the university? And what is it gonna be? You know, this is a time in our country when even the idea of the public good, I think, has come under significant, significant stress. And increasingly, assumptions are, if you can, you know, if you can buy it, if you have the means to buy it, you can, you can have it. But is there something that actually the whole public, the people uh, can have that is going to be provided independent of financial wherewithal, independent of class background, independent of some form of privilege. This university speaks to the very idea of the public good. And what our parents, what our alumni can do in the way in which they talk about Cal, but also the way in which they engage uh, in their own lives as citizens, is make clear that the idea of the public good cannot die. It is part of what makes the American dream real. We don't want it to become just a dream again. And Berkeley encapsulates the best of a tradition. It began with the land grants, but it continues with our commitment to access and the fact that we can offer as good an education here to the students who come as any private university can. We need that to continue. So the last question. This says to me, and it and I sense the extent to which so much is at stake in terms of confronting our budgetary challenges and of putting this university on a sustainable financial foundation and sort of insulating it from external forces. I mean, that's a heavy burden, isn't it? I mean, or do you feel really that we are all on the same page here and that really there's a shared understanding of how much is at stake in terms of this university's future? It's a heavy burden, but it's a heavy burden in some ways for all of us. Mm -hmm. And I think the sense that that burden is shared is what keeps all of us going. You know, these jobs, uh, sometimes you say, you know, uh, why do you do something like this, you know? Wake up every day with uh, fire in your belly because the, 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 the meaning of this university, of this institution, 
uh, its importance and the fact that that importance is so widely recognized, but nowhere more, nowhere more than for those who have a direct connection, whether as alums, as parents, as students, as staff, as faculty, as administrators. But we all have to work together to make sure this burden is not just something that we carry, but something that we move forward into the future. Well, we've come to the end of our time, and of course there is a lot of information we couldn't cover in such a relatively short period of time. But due to the overwhelming response from you, our audience, we hope to host future webcast events to allow your important voices to be heard. Chancellor Dirks, I want to thank you for your candidness uh, in addressing the issues and the comprehensiveness and for the time that you spent with us this evening. It was my great pleasure, Dan. And I want to thank you, our audience, and for joining us and for submitting such excellent questions. Now, you will be able to view the complete video on demand in the next 24 hours by visiting newscenter.berkeley.edu. Good night, and what would it be at Cal without it but go, go Bears! Bears.